In this time period in uh, the Netherlands, there's a middle class for the first time, there's a merchant class, and there is all of a sudden a demand for this kind of painting, paintings of everyday life. So the artist isn't showing a monumental scene from history, um, they're not showing a scene from the Bible, but they're showing something that you might see in your everyday life as you are walking down the street past the, the pond that was frozen over in the winter time. Um, uh, and so it not only was this kind of an entertaining picture for um, a middle class Dutch citizen to have in their home in the 17th century, but it also really gives us as viewers in the 21st century a window into what life was like um, in this time period. Um, not only uh, how they spent their leisure time, um, we're also able to see details like how they dressed. So we see these incredible hats, actually um, several different styles of hats, the jackets that they wore, the boots, we see the way that the horse is outfitted in this really quite elaborate saddle. Um, we even see um, this ship in the background, that's a curious detail. Uh, what could be going on with the ship? Simplifying the advent of trade. Excuse me? Signifying the advent of trade beyond your borders. Exactly. So there's a lot of um, merchant activity going on. Um, the Dutch have become this incredible seafaring power in the 17th century. Um, but it's also uh, indicative of this kind of entertainment that's happening in this painting. Um, it's a ship that's kind of floating along the surface of the ice rather than in the water. So it's more further entertainment and evidence of what people were doing with their leisure time in this, uh, in this period. Um, what, what other details uh, kind of jump out at you when you're looking at this painting? That tree. It's the tree, that yeah. Tree. Really, really <laughs> interesting. So it's uh, barren, there are no leaves on it. What other kind of details do you notice about the tree? It's like cut off almost. It doesn't look like a full grown tree, even though it's a huge trunk. Yeah, so it has this enormous trunk, but it's suddenly uh, it's truncated, if you will, <laughs> uh, at the top. And we can see kind of new, uh, out, um, new growth coming out of the top of it. So um, interesting kind of environmental detail from the period. What other um, details jump out at you? There's a fire in the background. Yeah, so we see uh, back here, is that what you're talking about? Some kind of structure, it looks like there might be smoke. Uh, and it, if you look very closely, it looks like there's actually a really large crowd of people gathered around it. And I think I see even another horse. So this ice is obviously stretching very far into the background. The artist has shown us a really large depth of field. I also notice um, at the very edge, kind of at the horizon line back here, there's a little city articulated. So he's giving us kind of a specific sense of place. Um, this could be a specific city in the Netherlands. We're not sure. So articulating these um, beautiful buildings. What, what other details do you? I can't see, see any women. No women. women. What, what do you make of that? The women are home cooking. <laughs> That's, so that's a great observation. We see all these men together. Um, they're playing, having a great time, but the women are conspicuously absent. So that really gives us an idea of what the role of women was in the society um, in, the, in the 1600s, that perhaps it was their responsibility to really stay home, uh, and they weren't able to have the, the leisure time to play this kind of game. Um, as their husbands and sons did, unfortunately. It seems like the number of people that really a sense of community as well. Absolutely. So it is a really large gathering of people. So we have a sense that there's exactly a community. Um, people, there's a, 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 a great sense of kind of brotherhood. Um, uh, and these people seem familiar to each other. Um, it's obviously something that they do pretty regularly. This isn't necessarily a special occasion. So they seem very used to each other's company. Um, and again, a, a real sense of kind of fraternity happening in the painting. Looking at um, a painting uh, by Claude Monet, this is called Houses of Parliament in the Fog, and it's one of a series of paintings that he executed in London at the very beginning of the 20th century um, uh, of 
the, the, this specific kind of architectural monument in London, the Houses of Parliament. Um, one thing that I love about this painting is when you approach it from afar, it almost appears to be monochromatic. You see just this almost solid blue canvas, and it's really only as you start approaching it that these forms start appearing out of the haze. You can see the very distinct um, architecture of the Houses of Parliament. You start to see the sense of the Thames River here in the foreground of the painting and this sort of hazy blue sky that really blends in um, and almost becomes one with the river. Um, and uh, that's an effect that Monet uh, really cultivated. He um, would sit on the balcony of a hospital that was right across the river from the Houses of Parliament and paint over and over and really try to capture the atmospheric effects, capture the specific effects of the weather, uh, and also this hazy fog, this really thick fog that he called the, the envelope um, that creates this, um, again, almost monochromatic effect. Now, if we think about London at the beginning of the 20th century, what's, uh, what's happening? Um, and we're thinking about industrialization, right? So when we consider all the factories, the trains, the, the rapid um, technological advances that were being made, um, and think about the fog, what, what could it actually be? Um, smog. smog, yeah. So it's this really noxious, toxic um, smog that is creating this beautiful effect that Monet has been able to so elegantly um, translate onto, onto this canvas. Now, what, what other kind of details do you all notice when you're looking at this? The boatman. The boatman, yeah. So it's a really subtle detail, and again, if you're looking at it from far away, you might not see it immediately, but we see just the, the a hint that there's some activity happening here on the river in the form of these gondoliers. So we can make out an oar here and kind of two figures, but they're really only articulated through a few brush strokes. So it's, it's incredible that Monet is able to use such an economy of means to create such a specific um, uh, object in the, in the foreground of the painting. And what else do you notice about the painting? I think the light. The light. Upper right corner is interesting. Absolutely. So as we said, the painting is really primarily made in shades of blue. Um, we do see a, kind of a few hints of red, but then there's this really strong sense of this rosy orange in the top right corner. And one, th one thing that also stands out to me is exactly how it's reflected here. So we see this kind of fixation on light and water and reflection in a lot of Monet's work, and his late work is really no exception. So he's really interested in capturing this very specific moment, um, capturing his own impression, of course, um, as a leader of the Impressionist movement, um, in the way that the sun is very specifically reflected on the surface of the river. Um, this also uh, has a really interesting effect on the composition, of course, in that the painting is really unbalanced, um, whereas the, the orange uh, of the sun and of the reflection is completely over to one side. And we can, if we start to look at all of the kind of compositional details of the painting, we notice that it really is heavily weighted on the right side of the canvas. The Houses of Parliament are uh, off-center, set on the right side, and even the boatmen are on this side of the canvas. So he's created this almost um, uneasy sense of asymmetry, um, which creates really a, a dynamic looking experience. Um, what other kind of details stand out to you? His brush strokes are just luscious. Like, I just want to touch them. Yeah, his <laughs> brush strokes. It's, he's not cr trying to create an illusion. We can really see almost the way that he painted it. Um, we can see his, uh, his individual brush strokes, um, especially in these details that we just looked at um, with the, the sun in the sky and the reflection on the water. We can almost imagine Monet standing on that balcony and just quickly painting this outside, out of doors, and trying to capture his own um, impression of this, uh, this moment as quickly as possible. What else do you see? I love the detailing of the castle or the, you know, the tower and yeah. you can get the sense of the Gothic 
richness of it without Absolutely. a lot of detail. So you can really get a sense of this architecture, even though it's painted in this hazy fashion, the building enveloped by this thick smog, we really get a sense of what this building looks like. So he's able to be both kind of general and specific at the same time. So we can really see these individual spires. We can see uh, the, the very top of the um, roof of the Houses of Parliament kind of uh, uh, jutting into the, the evening sun. Um, and so he really does give this very specific sense of the architecture. Um, this painting was done relatively uh, late in Monet's career, so 1903. Um, there's, uh, so you can kind of see um, the way that his uh, career has developed, how he's moved away from these um, almost more naturalistic relatively paintings into these really, really, um, hazy, nearly abstract canvases. So he's really made some drastic stylistic changes over the course of his career. Partially that's perhaps because of his degrading eyesight um, towards the end of his life, but I think that um, his uh, uh, eyesight really um, gives us this uh, incredible nearly abstract canvas um, where we can really see this specific scene, but also see um, the beautiful kind of compositional elements that he's put into creating a nearly monochromatic canvas. Um, any co other comments about this painting? I, think, I, yeah. know, I know it's not necessarily the morning light, obviously, mm -hmm. but I think that because of the colors he chose to have the sun come in, it kind of, despite the, the murkiness and the smell that you're talking about, because yeah. it is smog and pollution, it almost gives like a, an optimistic and a hopeful tone because of the warmth. I don't know if that's the right word for it because I don't teach art, but the warmth of the colors. Absolutely. So we actually see an interesting combination of both warm and cool colors. We think of blue as typically being a, a cool color, and that's um, occupying the majority of the canvas. But then there is really this this um, rising warmth through the light and the sun that we've looked at through these oranges, the reds. If you look closely, you can see actually some pinks um, mixed in, um, kind of put on the surface of the canvas um, throughout the composition. So it does have this sense of warmth, perhaps optimism. And I think that um, Monet and his contemporaries at the beginning of the 20th century didn't necessarily know that the smog was such a negative environmental thing. And really for him, it was just this beautiful effect that enveloped the buildings um, in this kind of um, ethereal uh, moment. And so um, for him, I think it, it especially was a, a good thing because he was able to paint canvases like this. And he did paint, he was really kind of fixated on this specific um, piece of architecture and would come back to this balcony over and over again and try to capture it at different times of day um, and different kind of effects of weather. We're looking at a painting uh, by Eastman Johnson um, called Negro Life at the South. Um, our painting is actually a smaller version of a much larger painting that Eastman Johnson originally made in about 1859. Um, our painting was made in 1870. Um, his work, the original work, was so popular that he people wanted to reproduce it, and so he created this smaller version, which is actually pretty faithful to um, the original uh, kind of um, large, uh, larger canvas. Um, in the composition um, so that color lithographs could be made of this work so that it could be distributed through the press um, and throughout the country. Um, but I just want to start um, by really looking at the painting and uh, uh, looking at the different figures and the different kind of vignettes that are happening. Um, what, what, when you all were uh, standing closer to the painting and looking at it, what were the first things that you noticed? What kind of figures did you see? A white woman who looks like she's been up to no good. Yeah, so he said a, so a white woman who's up to no good. Or she looks like maybe she's been up to no good. Yeah, so we have this uh, figure um, over at the right, and uh, a white woman wearing a perhaps traditional um, 
19th century dress. It looks actually looks quite formal. And uh, why do you think that she looks like she's up to no good? That's an interesting comment. Uh, she seems out of place in the scene, and she seems to be moving away from uh, the scene as well. So out of the scene, I guess. She, oh, so she I see her moving in. Yeah. Yeah, you see her moving in. Like more peaking, more peaking, like peaking around the corner on. almost. Yeah, so she looks like curious. A kind of idea that she's between worlds. Yeah, so she, she's almost separated from the rest of the scene, right, by this kind of architectural detail of a, a, an empty doorway of some sort that's not connected to any other sort of architecture. It's a really curious detail. And we have a dispute about whether she's kind of moving towards the rest of the scene or moving away from it. Um, but people seem to think, in general, that she sort of stands out um, compared to the rest of the scene. Um, what you else? Know, you yeah. things point to her. Banjo's pointed at her, and of course the intensity of the light that sort of frames her face and shoulders. I mean, so she's intended to be a focal point of, in some respect, is it? Absolutely. The dog, the dog yeah. The yeah. 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 And though no one's paying attention to her except for the one figure, the girl looking at her, who is it, it almost like imitating the pose that she's making. The girl in the blue dress noticed that. It's really interesting. Absolutely. So we're noticing that the composition is sort of directing our attention towards this figure um, off to the side. So the handle of the banjo, um, or the neck rather, is kind of pointed towards her. The dog is looking at her. These children are kind of looking at her. But people are not really inter actually interacting with her. Um, and there's even a sense that the light is sort of directed um, onto the side of the painting. So we're supposed to have our attention directed to this figure. Um, what, what else do you notice? What else do you see? Yeah. The, the two African-American women under the tree are working, and our interloper woman, and then this woman over here, um, seem, they seem to be flirting. Is that? there something about, yes, those two women versus these, there's a juxtaposition between the one who's under the tree and then the one who's with the child. So we have kind of a combination of activities happening here. So we have some women here who appear to be occupied by some sort of work. Perhaps uh, it's, it's a little hard to tell what's, what's going on, but they seem to be occupied um, in work-related activities rather than kind of leisure time activities or even uh, flirting. Uh, kind of happening over here, and this interesting couple seem to be engaged in some sort of flirtatious exchange. You also have a juxtaposition between the skin colors. Yeah. I mean, the woman's mm -hmm. skin is very much a light skinned African American woman, so you get that kind of, she's almost a balance against the white woman on her side. There's a yeah, multitude so of, of skin tones. Skin yeah, so yes. there are. Most people agree there's only one white person, right. and it's that mm -hmm. woman. So, so we think over here on the right, this is. Um, the only white woman, and the rest of the uh, figures in the painting are African American. Um, why do you think the artist chose to represent kind of one white person, um, and as, especially thinking about the time period when this was painted? So again, the original larger painting that was shown uh, in an exhibition was painted in 1859, and, and our copy here is from 1870. What kind of message do you think the artist could be trying to send with the with this painting and with this kind of combination of figures? Where was it painted? Um, the painting I, is often goes by a nickname, uh, My Old Kentucky mm -hmm. Home. Yeah. It was first exhibited under the name My Old Kentucky Home. So knowing that, what what does that kind of well, thing? Well, you, yeah. you can see the contrast in the two homes in the painting. The one mm -hmm. on the right is definitely it yeah. So the, I think contrast, absolutely. So I think the architecture is really important here to kind of understanding the painting. So that's a great point. We can actually see two different structures that are just radically different in their condition um, in the painting. Um, over here on the right, um, and really separated from the main scene by this wall, this barrier here, is a more uh, kind of affluent home, as she said. And then the main structure that all of our figures are standing in front of, and perhaps it's their home where they live, um, is really dilapidated. It's falling apart. We can see these broken um, rafters. 
we can see this moss that's kind of covering the roof, and the roof is really deteriorating. Well, it was at one time an interior, wasn't it? You see the hearth, and you know that that was the interior of the room at one time, and this whole end of it's been so this is a great observation. Um, when you really look closely, you notice these details. This doorway that we looked at earlier that we thought was really strange, and this hearth here, uh, and then perhaps this wall that's kind of jutting out into nowhere and kind of breaks off, uh, indicate that perhaps this used to be an interior, but the house has really deteriorated to the point where it's actually now out of doors. Uh, the, the roof has kind of gone away and the walls have all rotted. Um, so this uh, activity is all happening in this sort of ambiguous space between interior and exterior. And it's almost like a return to nature with the, the mossy grass on the roof and the animals up there. Yeah, so Possibly great. We see, we see some creatures kind of crawling on the roof here as if the, the house is being returned to this more primal state. So that looks like some sort of bird, maybe. Inside. Yeah, there's a tree, even. There's a, there's a rooster in the tree, and a chicken, a hen, sitting there. And uh, I don't know, is that? Where's the rooster? It's in the tree. Now. Oh, wow, I had not even noticed yeah, that. So this is the value of close looking. <laughs> we, <laughs> we notice these wonderful details that, um, that can escape us otherwise. So there's actually a rooster up here, and then there's a, a hen, perhaps, another kind of chicken. There's a certain school of yeah. that makes a lot over the rooster and the chicken. I don't know. Tell us that. more about that. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you tell me what you think. I mean, uh, well, where the rooster is, where the chicken is, and what, I don't know. What do you all think? Do you think that there's a significance to this, or is it kind of just a whimsical detail? Chickens coming home to roost. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps he's alluding to the, this, uh, the idea of chickens coming home to roost. Um, Who is Casey Johnson? Um, we, we need to know more about the artist. You're right. Yeah, that's that's a, actually, the that is the question. Yeah. So yeah. I'll give you just a little um, bit of information about kind of the way that the painting was received. Um, it's uh, thinking about 1859, sort of the years leading up to the Civil War, there's a lot of um, dispute over sl the issue of slavery. And interestingly, this painting has been interpreted variously to be both pro-slavery and anti-slavery. So it's really ambiguous. We're, we're not really sure um, what the artist exactly intended. Um, and I think it's really uh, the person who's looking at the painting can really bring to it what, what they want to. And that's how it really functioned um, when it was originally painted, and I think how it still functions today. So um, I'd love to hear from you. What are the arguments that this is a pro-slavery painting? Yeah, they're happy. They're having a great time. We see um, some games happening here, um, this man playing banjo. They really look like they're enjoying themselves. What, what other details do you notice that might support the argument that this painting is in favor of slavery? Well, there's the curious white girl who's otherworldly. She's not part of their world. She's separate. Yeah, so going back to this detail of this woman who's sort of peeking in, peering in on this world, um, uh, perhaps um, white observers in 1859 who encountered this painting in the original exhibition felt like this figure is almost a stand-in for them. This is really giving them a window into this different world that they're not a part of. So she's sort of a stand-in for the viewer. Um, what about, the, yeah, go ahead. another child up in the window, which could be mm -hmm. interpreted as family or a home. Uh, nice to be. Exactly. So we have another set of figures that we haven't really looked at here, a mother and child. Um, interestingly, the child appears to be kind of sitting on this dilapidated roof. Um, but there's a, a sense of home, again, a sense of kind of contentedness. Now, what about the idea that the painting is actually uh, anti-slavery? What would support that argument? Everything. Everything. Yeah. Tell me yeah. more. Um, I see it as the artist trying to draw a reaction from society and that we have what I think is like an adolescent girl from the well-to-do house coming in kind of peeking to see what it's like and it's nothing like she's growing up with. You don't see adult whites there uh, because they generally didn't associate with the health. 
And so it was like, oh, let's see what's going on in the back. And then to see the rundown of the building and everything else, I think the artist would have tried to get to society to say, this is actually what's going on behind the scenes. Absolutely. So it's almost like a, um, the 19th century, century equivalent of investigative journalism, right? So it really exposing these conditions that, we, that the, the rest of society, that the society that this woman belongs to, um, would prefer not to look at. The, the fact that there, uh, these people are living in this just uh, structure that is barely existing, that's really, again, falling apart. Um, so, so many kind of negative aspects, uh, especially when juxtaposed, again, with this um, more uh, structurally sound home that we see just in the top right corner of the painting. I think also the juxt what we talked about earlier, those, the gradations of skin color mm -hmm. show or hint at um, sort of a false this white world that they pretended to separate, but clearly there has mm -hmm. been this mixing, absolutely, and that doesn't that does, isn't discussed, and so I think that's an interesting. Well, we're going yeah, to speak to that's exploitation too. Right. Yeah. This campaign, mm -hmm. I see the, the young lady flirting as a uh, product of exploitation, and the child of the body too. Well, a lot of people that it's that issue that they tie the rooster and the chicken to, believe it or not, mm -hmm. that the rooster is on the the white side. Hen oh. is on the black side. Oh, and so very interesting. That, that I, don't, I don't know if I buy that or not, but you will read that in some places. Yeah. So yeah. perhaps there is this deeper meaning to, mm -hmm. the, to the combination of the rooster and the chicken. And the fact that there is this gradation of skin tones, again, speaks to the sort of false narrative of whiteness that um, has been um, propped up by white society um, and the artist here is trying to uh, get rid of that illusion um, and kind of point out the, the falseness of that and the exploitation of African Americans um, specifically by uh, white men. So it's it's a really interesting painting. Uh, it looks like we're we're running out of time but I have a feeling we could talk about it a lot more but luckily I think you're gonna hear more about it this afternoon. We're looking um, now at this incredible work from our collection of decorative arts and design. This is called the Century Vase. Um, it was made by Carl Mueller and the Union Porcelain Works in Greenpoint, Brooklyn um, in 1876. Now, judging from the date, 1876, and the title, what, what would you immediately <laughs> infer about the, this work of art? It's a commemorate. It's, it's made to commemorate, exactly. It's really a celebration of the first 100 years of the United States, and it was originally displayed at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876. So it's really, again, a, a commemoration and a, and a celebration of the past, um, all of the monumental events that led to the creation of the United States, um, and of the, the present and the future. Um, and what kind of iconography is the artist using to indicate that he's celebrating these kind of three aspects, the present, past, and future of the country? What kind of details do you notice? I'll, I guess I can start by saying one thing that, that really stands out to me immediately is this central figure who's repeated on both sides, um, made in this uh, beautiful relief um, that's coming out of the surface of the, the vase. George Washington, right? So um, sort of uh, the, taking to this central position um, as this hero, and um, of course at this time period around the centennial, there are representations of George Washington everywhere. And so this is uh, not uncommon in that respect. But what, what other kinds of um, details did you all notice? It seems like the past events are on the bottom, on the bottom register that are in uh, black and white, or gray tones mm -hmm. and sculptural, and then the more present and future events are in color in the middle register. So we're noticing some patterns. So there's um, a series of these bas relief, so very low um, carved um, events that are depicted along the bottom. And these are made out of um, uh, biscuit porcelain. So it hasn't actually been glazed. So the, the um, artist is using 
many different types of decoration to indicate the kind of distinction between these past events and then things that are kind of technological innovations are more in this um, kind of central uh, panel of the, of the vase. And these are um, actually glazed and done in this very careful um, colored decoration. Um, so if uh, you're looking at these bottom scenes, um, can you actually identify uh, any of them? What what stood out to you all? The tele. So so we noticed a telegraph, and this is really in um, this idea of technological innovations. Can someone point out where you see the telegraph on here? So uh, these kind of two scenes right here that go together, and um, we see a man. He's wearing a red shirt and a hat climbing up what looks like a modern day telephone pole and he's setting up these wires. So this is um, really exciting at the time, of course, new ways of communication, new technology, um, and new infrastructure that's being uh, created all across the country um, that's really being celebrated. What about these past scenes? One thing that I see over here on kind of the, the um, backside of the vase, I see some men holding um, boxes. Uh, it looks like the, exactly Boston Tea Party. So that's an uh, easy one to recognize. Um, we see this sort of angry and determined face of this man just throwing a box into the river. So it's really a celebration of this act of defiance that that got our country started. What what other kinds of scenes do you notice? Native Americans. So we see some Native Americans. Do we? Can we guess what might specifically be happening here? Treaties. So I think on the uh, other side, we see a treaty being made with Native Americans, and this is specifically William Penn. Um, so what might be significant about, significant about including William Penn on this? Going back to, yeah, exactly, Philadelphia. So celebrating the specific state, um, Pennsylvania, uh, and Philadelphia, where the vase was originally exhibited. What else? Is there a revolutionary soldier mm -hmm. on this side? Yeah, so we see a revolutionary soldier right here. Um, he's uh, in his very uh, 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 recognizable 18th century garb. He's got the three-pointed hat and a musket and bayonet. Um, so looking back, celebrating the Revolutionary War, um, the, the creation of our, of, of our country. What else? Yeah, the buffalo, of course. These, these really um, stand out. They're one of the sort of most defined details and made uh, so sculptural, they're almost um, in the round, not quite, um, but definitely the most sculptural uh, moment in, in the vase. What's, uh, what about the buffalo? Why do you think the artist would choose to include buffalo? It's a kind of a curious detail. Destiny's westward expansion. Exactly. Yeah, 1876. So the idea of manifest destiny moving further westward, the buffalo are really an icon of the west and also a really distinctively American animal, right? And we actually see a, kind of a lot of animals um, uh, uh, in this sort of transitionary part of the vase between the scenes of the present and future and the scenes of the past. We see a dog, a, a ram, um, perhaps a walrus, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, um, another buffalo, and these are, again, animals that really illustrate the richness um, of our nation. And, and so I think in combination, all of these scenes of, of the technology, of the kind of these important historical events, and of these animals are all in all just really celebrating our country. Um, we don't necessarily see any kind of skepticism um, it's really just illustrating a single point of view. And I think we have to wrap up on this one, actually. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to add something because this is the piece that I worked on. In addition to it being to commemorate the first 100 years of our nation, it's also a form of advertisement. So if we put it in context, it's 1876. We know it's the Gilded Age. But it's also the time where industrialization is really picking up mm -hmm. in our country. So this would be displayed right next to the work product of manufacturers from Europe. 
so that we can highlight not only our, our natural resources, in this case with the um, animals that are really iconic representations of our country, but the industrialization, the innovations, the manufacturing, and then now we can truly compete uh, with the Europeans, which is something that we were trying to point out during that centennial um, exposition as well. Yeah, and kind of along that line, I know, sorry, I know we need to wrap up. Um, this, uh, I think the material that it's made out of is also really important because this is actually hard paste porcelain. Um, you may know that um, it took a very long time for Europeans to figure out how to make real porcelain um, and even longer for that technology to come over to the US. But here, Union Porcelain Works uh, in Brooklyn um, is using real hard paste porcelain. And so they're demonstrating that they, again, have this not only technology, but also craftsmanship that not only matches, but even rivals the rest of the world. So again, it's really patriotic um, uh, for all of these different reasons. Yeah. It also shows inside the lip of fashion, which is a Roman symbol that it kind of represents that together we're stronger than it right. which also would tie in the European competition. Yeah. I'm wondering if the wall signifies the purchase of glass too, because we're right in that period. Yeah. The last thing that I, I want to point out as you guys walk out is that there is one panel in particular that was really difficult for us to identify what it was. Clearly, when we see the tea chest and mm -hmm. individuals dressed like Native Americans, we can identify that as a Boston Tea Party. But if on your way out, you can focus on the one that has two men on opposite sides with hats and two different trees, and then there's a third figure with a board and some items in the middle. I want you to think about that and what that could possibly mean, because that's something that we're going to discuss later on this afternoon. Great. Okay. Yeah, it's this one here. I was curious. Yes. I, I am so interested in all of your theories <laughs> to see if we're going to be at the same page. Well, it's looking at our But that one. That <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, this one right here. Okay, I could never see the inside. <laughs> egg shaped things. This painting is called The Expansionist, although it's sometimes also referred to as The Traveled Man. The artist is Francis Davis Millet, uh, not pronounced Millet, as I originally thought, um, who went by Frank, an American painter. Um, and this painting was made in 1899. Um, uh, one fun trivia fact, uh, as your colleague just pointed out, about the artist is that he actually died in the Titanic. So, uh, he also was I did not know that. That's a great, that's a really fun, interesting fact that he also invented spray paint for the, <laughs> the Chicago World Exposition. Oh, yeah, I learned a lot about it when we read The Devil Lord's Sea. Oh, oh okay, great book. Um, I think uh, the best way to start looking at this painting is to really look at the individual details and think about um, what, what kind of details the artist decided in, to include and, and what those might mean for the the larger composition. So over to you again. Um, what was the first thing that really stood out to you when you started looking at this? The shoes. The shoes. Mm. Yes. So we're looking over here, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of shoes do you see? All different kinds of shoes. All different kinds of shoes. Um, they're all Eastern. Exactly. Eastern. They're all yeah, so they make a connection to Asia. So mm -hmm. they all seem to be kind of different Eastern style shoes. Really, even the globe, the globe, the globe is right. focusing. The globe. So there's a, another great detail. This globe that's really centrally placed in the foreground um, is on the Pacific. So we see some kind of Pacific well, the island. East is facing him. It's facing into the room, isn't it? The east. So what, what do you what do you see? The, the east is facing us. So we think it looks like Australia. This looks like Asian Australia continent. here, uh -huh. and the Pacific Ocean, and kind of the Pacific, the Pacific Ocean, and some mm -hmm. of the, these um, Pacific Island nations. Um, it's not not clearly articulated, so we have to kind of read into it. So um, we could think that perhaps this is kind of um, again the. Pac the Pacific nations kind of facing out towards us, the viewer, um, and the shoes are all really standing out to us. What, what other kind of things? Are there maps on the bottom? Um, so, of maps or diagrams and the, the quilt paper? Yeah. 
These look like they, they could be maps. So there's this huge pile of curled, uh, curled up paper on the floor. Um, uh, again, he hasn't given us a ton of detail, but we can sort of infer that these are maps and they're kind of related to the globe. And again, thinking about that title, The Traveled Man, perhaps this is referring to all the nations um, that this figure has, has visited. What other kind of things are included? The puppets on the table. There are puppets, yeah. So we're looking at these puppets here, do they look like they're um, also from his travels? Yeah. So they're accumulated from, from somewhere, perhaps another Eastern country. Um, and uh, I also noticed these masks here. So these look like they could be sort of related to the puppets and also perhaps gathered on some sort of um, ex uh, expedition. What, what else do you see? Is that a rug, like a oil rug or a Turkish rug? Yeah, there's this interesting detail. So it doesn't look exactly like a tablecloth that's um, draped on top of his table or his desk. Yeah. Um, and again, it has uh, an Eastern feel. There are these uh, really beautiful geometric patterns. Um, this, this kind of bright reddish orange it looks like it could be uh, a rug from also an Eastern right. country. Uh, perhaps, per, or, sure, it could be from Turkey. Um, also, so somewhere, so we're, we're getting the sense that there are all these accumulated objects that come from different parts of the world, different countries. What, what other kind of objects are? So, yeah, so musical instruments. So we see musical instruments in a couple places. Um, a xylophone here. Um, this looks like maybe some kind of symbol. Um, perhaps these are instruments. Um, they, I've also read that they might possibly be some sort of weapon. Weapons. Yeah, weapons. Um, so these, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of different kind of cultural artifacts uh, accumulated from around the world. It's like a very strange thing hanging from the beam. Yeah, another great detail. See. They look like figures, like skeletons or dolls. So there are these uh, objects that are sort of cast in shadow hanging from the, the roof beam. Um, and they, they look like perhaps they could be skeletons. So we're seeing this kind of, um, it almost looks like a rib cage here. Um, and there's kind of a hint of red and blue. Um, perhaps there's some sort of fabric. So it could be another kind of cultural artifact. Um, we're not exactly sure, it's kind of ambiguous, but it certainly seems foreign in some way. What um, about the figure? Yeah, and I'm also attracted by the female figure and how she seems to have anachronistic wardrobe or clothing. Isn't this from 1899? Yeah, this is from 1899. And that looks like more colonial it to is. me. Absolutely, so too, yeah. we're seeing, we're it's seeing... contemporary with the past. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. So we're noticing the clothing of the two figures seems anachronistic. So it doesn't seem like it's from 1899. It's older. When, when would you say the clothing looks to you like it's from? 1700s. 1700s. So quite a while, over a century earlier. So we're thinking about kind of the colonial period. Um, and uh, that, that actually is really important in um, certain interpretations of this painting. Um, thinking about 1899, um, this is the end of the Spanish-American War, so it's painted exactly in the wake, and so there's a lot of conversations happening about imperialism, yeah, exactly, ex expansionism, uh, and kind of the idea of colonialism. Is it right for a country like the United States that itself has escaped from the yoke of colonialism to then become an imperial power? So there's a, a, a real conversation um, happening. Do you get a sense of whether the artist had an opinion on this, whether he was arguing one way or the other? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what makes you say that? He's, because he's, he's collecting. You can tell he's wealthy because of the architecture of the house, all of that wooden inlay. <coughs> that, that takes a lot of money to have that on the walls. And these items aren't useful items. They're fanciful items, leisure items. And, and the two figures are totally oblivious. They're, they're not interested in all of these collections. So the collections sort of seem like they're scattered around the room almost haphazardly. Um, 
and, and these two figures are clearly figures of privilege. Um, I, I will point out that uh, in some interpretations of this painting, the shoes are actually really significant, and, and they're arguing in the other direction, that the artist is a kind of anti-imperialist, and that's because some people think these shoes are sort of standing in for all of the oppressed citizens of these, of these colonized countries um, who are forgotten. So certainly a lot of symbolism that we can read into this. I was also so, say yeah. about the quill. There's so many quills. He's clearly writing copiously. And I was thinking yeah. mm -hmm. that could be that anti-imperialist right. philosophy that he's somehow articulating his arguments against this right. imperialist idea. This is a great point. So he's, he's writing. Uh, and we can even see stacks of paper over by the window. So clearly, he's producing quite a volume of quills on the, on the floor. Too. He's, yep. He's discarding the, the Yeah, the discarded the quill pens. So, right. yeah. So, and what's beyond that? Yeah. What's beyond so what's the yeah? What's outside the window? Yeah. So it's another painting where the the subject matter is kind of clear, but the intention of the artist is again somewhat ambiguous, and we can read a lot into um, what's going on in, in the in the composition. The final point that I would make yeah. is that it seems like it's focusing more on the collection and not the appreciation. So just like you would have a set of colonies, whether it's the Philippines or Puerto Rico yeah. and elsewhere, but not really appreciating the indigenous individuals and those that are actually there. Yeah. You're just, just collecting branded. things. Yes. Exactly. Collecting, but we don't yeah, care. this is a this is a great point. They're they're surrounded by these <laughs> incredible objects and yet they seem completely indifferent to them. And she seems to admire the man, not the things that are right, so she's right. Her, directing her. There's mm -hmm. an not, strange not interaction. But yeah, if they had value, they would be collected mm -hmm. and put it in a place of prominence, but they're just all All scattered. Mind. Yeah. We're looking now at uh, two paintings that are actually a pair, and these um, are by Hale Woodruff. Um, a, a painter who lived and worked in Atlanta for uh, about 20 years um, in the kind of early to mid um, 20th century. And these paintings are actually studies for murals um, that were commissioned by the City of Atlanta Housing Authority. So um, on the top, um, study for results of poor housing, and on the bottom is a, the study for results of good housing. So clearly they're kind of a before and after, and there are, there are a lot of um, similarities and differences. Um, so let's start by taking a look at how, how the paintings are functioning together. What do you notice about them that is similar and what do you notice that's different? So we see some uh, outhouses uh, up here. So we're looking at uh, these plumbing yeah, structures. Indoor plumbing. So, we're thinking about the differences in plumbing, so that's an interesting place to start. Here, there's two outhouses in the top right corner, and this very dirty, murky looking uh, water, there's sewage. Yeah, there's no indoor plumbing. It's, so we're noticing that the top painting is really dirty as compared to... Yes. We see there's a lot of green. There's a very lush lawn. There's almost no green in this painting, mm -hmm. with maybe the exception of this woman's shirt. Um, it's very kind of dark, murky. Even the sky looks sad, right? So it looks kind of stormy, dark, versus this very uh, sunny blue sky with um, fluffy white clouds. So even there seems to be a very clear um, distinction in the kind of hygiene of the two paintings. I think that's that's also carried forth in the number of children. There's so many more children in the bottom versus the top, almost as if there's this progress through the generation that's allowed versus here where they're not. The yeah, so we're playing and happy. Mm -hmm. right. and so we see a difference fruit. in the number so of children and also in the type of activity. So um, we see maybe one, this, this might be a child, it's a slightly ambiguous um, children looking unhappy sitting on top of an overflowing garbage can. Um, here in this bottom painting, the results of good housing, um, we see these three children playing on a playground. We see one child over here, um, so generally seeming much more happy and healthy. Um, 
What is going on with the figures in these two paintings? Let's start with the top. What do we think is going on with these different figures? Mm, idleness. They're unhappy and they're just... So un we see unhappiness, we see idleness. There's not, there's not really a, a lot of activity. Disengage, mm -hmm. great word. So we see this one man here kind of sitting, his, his head on his hand like that, um, not, not doing much. In fact, we see a lot of this kind of head and hands. This woman here sitting like this. Um, this woman sitting on some sort of box looking dejected. Um, so a lot of idleness, disengagement. They, they, they seem to be being pushed down. Mm -hmm. So the, their bodies the look pushed down. That's, so their bodies look pushed yeah. down. This is a great observation. So we see a lot of this kind of posture with the yeah, spines, as opposed to down That's here. Right so more like this. Movement. So Stay if you tall. let's all try that. If you how do you yes. feel when you do that? Yes. Depressed. Yes. So the, the, what about this? Now let's put our shoulders back. Somewhat Somehow seem uplifted. uplifted. Yeah, right. smiling. So even just their, their emotions are conveyed through this very distinct difference in the posture. Um, we you already, can, yeah, go ahead. You can also see that in their clothing. In uh, their, yeah. And, and for me, the one at the top just seems to be like the passage of time, while in the bottom one, they seem to be engaged in productive activities, mm -hmm. whether it's planting or they're getting ready to go to work or do something else. Yeah, it looks uh, yeah. like there's work down here with the lunchbox. Uh -huh. So we and see no work up at the top. Right. We see this figure here in the results of good housing who has a lunchbox. He's wearing a jacket. Mm -hmm. He's upright, mm -hmm. perhaps heading off to some sort of job. We see this other figure here actually gardening, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like he might be holding some sort of trowel in his hand, planting flowers. Um, and we, we can see the difference in the clothing as well. So there's a much brighter palette. We already talked about the sort of browns of the environment in this top painting versus the greens here. But even their clothing is much brighter and happier. Mm -hmm. So the artist's intention is kind of clear here, right? What, what's the message that he's sending? Well, also, the foundation for the building in the bottom is very solid. Whereas right. at the top, it's very rocky and, and unstable. Yeah, so even looking at these two um, structures, this one seems to be on some sort of stilts, but they're not even uh, perpendicular to the ground. They're sort of jutting out. It looks really unstable um, versus this uh, brick structure here that has a really solid grounding, mm -hmm. solid foundation. Um, so a lot of contrast being drawn um, between, between the two scenes. Um, and now thinking about the title, results of poor housing and results of good housing, so he's directly tying it to these structures, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the message seems to be something like um, that just, but that through creating um, this good housing with the solid foundation, all of these other uh, positive effects kind of cascade out from there. Um, and, and I had mentioned earlier that these were commissioned by the City of Atlanta Housing Authority, so it's sort of, someone said propaganda. So um, it's really sending a very clear message about the, the mission of this organization that's commissioning these. And the uh, final murals actually were um, put on view in a brand new housing structure that was constructed during this time period, kind of in the lobby, to really promote the efforts of the government and, and um, of this specific agency. Uh, this is a painting called Mogama, a painting in four parts, part two, um, quite a long title. Um, it's by Julie Maritou, uh, an American artist, um, and it's made, it was made in 2012, so it's quite a recent um, work of art and a recent acquisition for us here at The High. Um, as the title um, would implies, um, this is one of four of this series. Um, uh, all, each canvas is 12 by 15 feet, so it's quite monumental. Um, and the paintings have now been distributed to four different museums. So we're lucky enough to have um, part two. Um, looking at this, uh, at this artwork, there's really a lot of layers. Um, there's a lot of different layers of kind of imagery and mark making. Um, what, uh, what, what do you see? What, are, what uh, immediately stands out to you looking at it? Buildings. 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 So Different. looking at the very kind of first layer, the, the layer that's furthest away from us, we start to see 
something that looks like buildings. They look like maybe architectural drawings. What do you notice about them? They seem to overlap. They overlap. So they're, they're perhaps referring to um, singular structures, but they're overlapping and they fail to resolve. So we have a general sense that there's, they're referring to architecture, but we're unable to uh, make out a single building as they kind of are layered on top of each other. Um, the title of this painting, again, at Mogama, um, is a reference to a governmental building in Cairo, um, in Tahrir Square. Now, thinking about when this was made, 2012, it's referring to extremely contemporary events of the Arab Spring, Tahrir Square being kind of the site of protest for the uprisings that happened um, in the Middle East um, uh, uh, beginning in uh, early 2011. Um, now, with that knowledge, um, does it give you any ideas about uh, this idea of the architecture, these architectural drawings that are really in this uh, layer in the painting? They give it place. They give it place. They give a sense of place. So perhaps these buildings are um, related to directly to Tahrir Square, and in fact they are. Um, so Julie Maritou and her assistants began, began this series by researching all of these buildings that are related to sites of protest, to public squares, um, where there has been kind of historical tumult, both in the Middle East, also Red Square in Moscow, um, squares in Ethiopia, Libya, Havana, uh, and they uh, took those buildings and created these, uh, again, architectural drawings, and those were actually projected onto the surface of the canvas, which is treated with these many, many layers of gesso, so it almost has um, the, the consistency of paper. And they drew these drawings on here, and they silk screened them on. So there's this very, um, uh, again, distinct and specific set of buildings, but they're overlapping and give, just giving a general sense of architecture. Now, um, that's very interesting, but the painting, of course, doesn't stop there. Um, what else do you see? What's kind of layered on top of those architectural drawings? The, the lines seem to, are on top, but also seem to draw your eye upward to this kind of confusion and chaos, yeah, chaos at the top. A sense of the chaos, storm, and there's right. a sense of upward movement. So we see these really gestural, expressionist marks, right, that are really drawing our eyes up to the top. Um, where we see just l lots of different marks. Um, and uh, unlike the, the drawings, which seem where we can make out specific details like windows or lights, um, we can't really understand. Um, it's hard to make out what they're specifically referring to, right? Mm -hmm. So she's using a language of abstraction. Mm -hmm. What else do you notice? It feels like smoke, like they're, mm -hmm. the marks are. So wh what makes you say that? It's just this dark, kind of oppressive, yeah, power, yeah. Yeah, so they're, the marks are sort of hazy and blurred, almost as if somebody kind of blurred it with their hand. Um, and they, they feel smoky and amorphous, right? Mm -hmm. um, In some places, it seems like a landscape, almost, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. as it goes up, it looks like a mountain landscape. So we're seeing some, uh, a sense of a landscape, um, perhaps mountains. Um, and re references to different uh, geographical locations, right? Mm -hmm. What other kinds of details do we see? It seems like the artist's choice of materials is representing different things in the painting. Mm -hmm. Tell so me more about would, that. You had talked about the buildings being you know, very particular, mm -hmm. very straight, and that was referencing different government buildings or different buildings that were involved in conflict. And then the dark gestural marks that look like they're graphite or pencil or charcoal maybe are representing something different for the artist and she's using that in a way to express a different, like a, a set of, they're organic looking, so it could be a set of people, it could be a set of animals. And then the colored lines that are on top um, also seem like they would represent another, it's another way of the artist to communicate meaning. So those three items are probably purposeful material choices. So we're seeing really layers not only of, um, of uh, different objects or uh, representations, but also three <coughs> different materials 
kind of layered on top of each other. So we see um, this very distinctive pen and silk screen layer. We see a layer that's this more smudgy, the smoke-like layer that we were looking at. And then these, um, these gestural colored lines. And so perhaps the artist is using these three different media to communicate kind of different ideas. Another thing that I, I notice is these really uh, uh, de well-defined dots. We see these passages of dots. Is it, a, it, think of it makes you think of pixels. Well, is it a yeah. reference to the fact that digital technology has played such a role in the revolution? They call it the Twitter revolution. Absolutely. You know? So the idea of the Twitter revolution, yeah. the fact that the, the, the revolution spread so quickly really as a result of the, the time and the technology um, that existed when it was happening. Perhaps even a reference to newspapers would still play some sort of role. So the, the way that images are reproduced in newspapers um, and kind of disseminated uh, internationally, um, uh, all of these things could be, could be playing a role. Um, we had talked a little earlier about the sense of abstraction, but there's also um, a real sense that she's referring to specific things that she saw um, in, in the protests, um, perhaps through uh, video or photographs, um, the, I, you see this uh, gesture in these, uh, this red line that almost looks like perhaps a flag or an arm. So we kind of get the sense of the emotion and the movement and the energy of the protesters um, conveyed through her kind of abstract and gestural mark making. So there's certainly um, a lot of sort of political uh, overtones um, in, in this painting and also in the other three that are, that are part of this series. Do you know anything about the square up there? So this, are you asking about the square of dots? Yeah. Well, what do you think about it? I like your idea of pixels. Pixels. Um, yeah, or bende dots. Or bende, bende dots. Bende. It could be either. So kind of this combination of old and new technology, bende the way dots, that images are, are reproduced. Refers to dots per inch. Yeah, little right, dots. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, you know, like you know yeah. I think it's important to note that uh, the Magama in um, Cairo mm -hmm. is actually a building that houses a church, a, sy a synagogue, and a mosque all in one building, which is significant. And you can see different representations mm -hmm. of those architectural elements. Of, mm -hmm. You know, here it's real decorative, like the Islamic culture uh, to architecture is, and then we have more repetition that you would typically see in a church. So we have all that playing into this context as well. So the idea of sort of three religions typically in conflict really coming together. And to, and to name it that. Exactly. Is important. So really perhaps the artist advocating for more unity internationally. And she's from um, the Mideast. Wow. Yeah, so Julie Maritu, originally born in Ethiopia, um, now lives and works in the United States, but certainly her, her own sense of, um, of her heritage is certainly playing into this in that she did also include um, buildings from uh, Addis Ababa and Ethiopia um, in this, the architectural aspects um, under, and the underlayer. Do the, do the four pieces, uh, do, do they go together as one large piece or do they represent a, a chronology? in some way, or how do they fit together? The, the four um, pieces were originally created for Documenta, which is one of the art world sort of major events that happens every five years in Kassel in Germany. Um, and they were originally exhibited together, I think on one huge wall. So if you think this piece is really overwhelming in its scale, imagining it times four, it's um, a really enveloping experience, I think, to see them together. Um, but she really deliberately wanted them to be separated. Um, there's, not a chrono there's not a sense of chronology and they are distinct works that can stand on their own. But the idea of them being spread across four different museums really refers to um, sort of the diaspora throughout the world of, um, of, the, Arab, of the Arab world um, into different countries. Um, In the very top of the canvas for me, mm -hmm. something elicits um, skyscrapers, a major metropolitan center, multi-story buildings. And I'm wondering if that's some reference possibly to September 11. So uh, looking up at the top, is, do you think of skyscrapers per, uh, because of the size of the painting? What, what's evoking that no, for actually, you? No, I mean, the, the marks the artist has made 
uh, to me, uh, if I look at that very long, I just see these tall buildings that have lots of windows and maybe not much personality or form. I don't see anything that's a religious symbolism there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the chaos emanating at the top of the, the canvas uh, where, the, where the smoky marks begin might have a reference, but I don't know. But Perhaps. That's just something that came to mind. It's, it's a, definitely an interesting association as we can think of this painting, which can seem so abstract on first, first approach, actually really being a reaction to maybe not just the Arab Spring, but the tumultuous events that we've experienced through the beginning of the 21st century um, in general. We are now uh, standing in front of another uh, contemporary artwork. This is by a local Atlanta-based artist, Radcliffe Bailey, and the title of the work is Destination Unknown. It's from 2005. Um, there's a lot happening. Um, it's the medium, I think, is really interesting. It's something you don't see very often. Um, this is uh, what he called a medicine cabinet um, work of art. So we can see that it's actually encased in um, this um, sort of black frame with a glass front on it. And we can see sort of layers of objects and imagery, um, even some kind of sculptural elements uh, piled uh, on top. What kind of imagery do we uh, initially see looking at this artwork? The days being marked down. So we see these kind of tick marks. Yes. Um, what makes you originally think that they're days? What, what brings that to mind for you? Well, I'm thinking about the middle passage and coming across. So let's, let's back up a days. little bit. So mm -hmm. perhaps the central element of this artwork is, of course, this ship, right? The ship coming across, right. So um, let's think about the title, Destination Unknown. What does that evoke for you? Slavery. Slavery. Yeah. So thinking about the middle passage, um, this ship um, carrying uh, enslaved individuals uh, crossing the ocean, going to an unknown destination, how terrifying. And so this idea of the tick marks as a way of keeping track of the days with no calendar, um, no other way of, of counting, this was really what they uh, had to resort to in order to keep track of the passage of time. So it's this kind of sense of ambiguity uh, as you're crossing into this unknown and really terrifying world. What other kind of imagery stands out to you in the artwork? I'm seeing the words behind the photograph image. So there's a photographic image and behind it there are words and what are the words? I can't Can you make them, make them out? Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone Mozambique. Gambia, Mozambique. So they're names of countries in Africa, right? So it's very explicitly making the connection. Specifically. Those are specifically slave trade countries. Specifically countries where there was a slave trade. So it's really making this explicit connection to the Black Atlantic Passage um, and to the, the experience of being enslaved. Um, what about this photograph? What do we see here in this image here? People working. So. Uh, really the, the result of the slave trade, right? So we're, we're seeing um, men, I think they're all men, um, engaged in some kind of agricultural activity. Um, so interestingly, uh, Radcliffe Bailey uses a lot of vintage photographs in his work. He was given many years ago a huge batch of these photographs, and they're primarily of unknown figures. So we really don't know the identity of these people. Um, we don't know exactly where it is, although uh, I believe uh, it, it might be in the Caribbean somewhere. Um, but there's some sort of agricultural activity. Um, Looks like they're growing rice. Well, that's what that's yep. what's making me think with Sierra Leone and Gambia. Those are those were rice growing countries, and and they that's the primary slaves in the, on the Georgia coast are from those areas. So the Gullah mm -hmm. culture comes from those countries. 
So the fact, so the, and the fact that it looks like rice makes me think that this is maybe even Georgia. So it could even be Georgia, so tied mm -hmm. really South specifically Carolina. to our own geography. Mm -hmm. yeah. People growing rice along the South Carolina or the Georgia coast, mm -hmm. a skill that they already would have had from their home country, um, thinking about these countries that are articulated in the writing behind the photograph. And then um, the anchor behind it, of course, everything is anchored in. Yeah. yeah so. There's an anchor here, right? And it's actually connected with this drawn line to uh, the ship. Um, what, what other kind of writing do you see on the background of this artwork? Well, the days and totals. the totals, but. So we see totals. So we, the tick marks, we think, might refer to the, the keeping track of the passage of time. But it perhaps seems these like an numbers, thing. it might be some sort of ledger, yeah. um, perhaps keeping track of the number of, of enslaved people. Um, Output per day, so mm -hmm. uh, some sort of accounting. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I specifically associate that we were discussing back here with sharecropping mm -hmm. and how it's really a continuation of slavery and everything but name. And you have kind of like an unknown destination. You have this uncertainty about the future. You have individuals that have been emancipated, but they don't have legal equality. We do not know what the future is going to have in store for the African Americans that are now freed men and women. Um, but don't have any legal protection. Absolutely, so that unknown destination doesn't necessarily refer to the, the end point for the ship, but it's also this really uncertain future and the continued exploitation, um, even after emancipation, after the end of the Civil War, through the sharecropping system. Mm -hmm. and, and the numbers remind me of that as well, where oftentimes they we're not even legally entitled to look at the books or had the ability to do the simple arithmetic to know whether or not they were being cheated. Absolutely. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the, the medium really quickly. So I had mentioned that um, these works are known as the medicine cabinet works, and they're actually in medium a, a reference to a type of artwork that was made in the Congo called Inkizi. Um, so Radcliffe Bailey is explicitly kind of connecting um, back to um, this really robust culture in uh, Africa prior to the slave trade um, with um, these explicit references to slavery. So really interesting use of media um, beyond the traditional kind of binary of painting and sculpture. The staining of the, it's, I the saw the sign tobacco mm -hmm. juice. Is that significant? That's right. So uh, looking at the uh, medium, he's actually using tobacco juice to create this sort of aged appearance of the paper that's this uh, kind of back layer. Um, and tobacco, yet another crop that was really uh, thriving off of the use of, of enslaved labor. Um, so it's certainly another direct, uh, really explicit connection to slavery. So yeah, the there's, boat provides a shadow. Absolutely, so we can see uh, the, the boat in that it's a sculptural element um, that's attached to this uh, surface. It's actually creating a shadow that is um, similar to the effect of the mark making with the tobacco, um, with the oil stick. Um, so he's really experimenting with different kinds of mark making, different kinds of um, expression um, in a single uh, work of art. Anyone have other observations about this? Yeah. We were talking about the years on it. It says 1751 to 1807. Um, so looking here, right. underneath this, this photograph, 1751 to 1807, what could the significance um, of that be? Well, 1807 was the, December 31st was the last day of the transatlantic slave trade in the United States, but we were trying to figure out what 1751 was. We think it's a Haitian revolution, and so we were wondering if his background might have had anything to do with Haiti. With yeah. Haiti in 1751? Not, not the official Haitian Revolution, but a slave rebellion that took place oh, in yeah. Haiti. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. So it could be a, a reference to this slave rebellion. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a really great um, idea that he's referring to these really specific historical events through the, through the dates that um, he's included, embedded in the imagery. By calling these medicine <coughs> cabinets? <coughs> Is this the past enclosed in something and it's medicinal in that it's healing to create these? So that's a really interesting question. Is it sort of healing to meditate on the past? 
to think about history. And I think um, that I, certainly is part of it, that kind of rehashing these events is really important rather than sort of papering over them um, and to, to think about exactly what happened and to talk about it and try to resolve it.